I'm Angelo Dionisio, um, and I have the privilege of speaking to you all this Mission Sunday. Um, so some of you don't know who I am. Um, you may be asking, who is this guy? What are his qualifications? Um, well, I can assure you that I am underqualified. Um, I'm not a pastor or preacher, so just lower those expectations a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I am underqualified, but aren't we all? Uh, so I currently serve on the Missions Council here at Heritage with my wife, Michaela, and we have two kids. One of them, they were in here talking earlier. Um, you've probably seen them running around, um, DeLuca and Soleil. Uh, so a little bit of background about me, um, just so you know where I'm coming from, my missions experiences. So immediately out of college, uh, I served in a country in um, West Africa called Cote d'Ivoire with an organization called Crew. Um, and so it's a French-speaking country just north of the equator. Um, can show the slide there for where that is, because a lot of people don't know where Cote d'Ivoire is. That's it. Right there. Um, <clears throat> it's very hot. It's about half Muslim and half mixture of Catholic and Protestant. And so I worked mainly with college students, um, kind of making disciples who would hopefully make more disciples. Sort of the two, 2 Timothy 2.2 2 model of, you know, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses uh, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Uh, and so I served there for three years. I spent a lot of time learning French so I could minister to the students in their own language. Uh, so I may just be the very first French-speaking Italian-American New Mexican to live in Africa. <laughs> so I'll take that one, yeah. <clears throat> uh, in 2019, uh, Michaela and I got married, uh, and I moved back from Ivory Coast and worked with college students at UNM for a little bit uh, before leaving staff with crew. And so since then, I've become a data analyst slash data scientist. So, you know, what does all that mean? Well, it means you're going to hear a lot about missions this morning, and you're going to see some, some charts and some data while we do that. Uh, but in all honesty, I've been, I've been praying that the Lord would use me, uh, sinful and weak as I am, to speak clearly, maybe slowly, I like to speak fast, um, speak clearly and biblically about missions today, um, and that's, you know, that I would be a blessing to you. So what I'm going to do is go through Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the classic Great Commission missions passage, so you guys can all start turning there, um, and just start off with a biblical basis for missions. And then the next thing I want to do is talk about foreign missions and some of the state of missions in the world today. And then answer maybe questions that you might have about how you can be involved in missions here in Heritage. Um, so if you all would stand with me uh, in the honor of the reading of God's word. And I'm going to start in verse 16, just to give us a tiny bit of context. <clears throat> now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Um, pray with me and we'll get started. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would um, be with us this morning. Open our ears to hear your word. Um, help it to, to change us and mold us. Um, help us to honor you um, this morning um, and give me words that I might speak clearly and boldly. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You all can be seated. All right. So, the main point this morning that I have from this passage is that the mission of the church is to make disciples of all nations because Jesus commands it and because Jesus is worth it. So the mission of the church is to make disciples of all nations because Jesus commands it and because he is worth it. So I have three sections today from the main passage. Um, it's a pretty small passage, so it could be in one section. But uh, the first one is the authority of Jesus in verse 18. And the second is the commission of Jesus, verses 19 through 20 first part of 20, and in the comfort of Jesus, the end. So the authority of Jesus, the commission of Jesus, and the comfort of Jesus. So I want to argue today a few things. One, not making disciples of all nations is disobedience to Christ. Uh, two, Jesus is worth the high cost, sometimes very high cost, of making disciples of all nations. And three, uh, the Western church has a bit of a focus problem when it comes to missions. So, I hope that the scriptures challenge you this morning. I hope that the statistics that I'll share and some of the realities of the world maybe sober you um, and even motivate you. Uh, and I hope that they give you a zeal and passion to see Jesus made known among the nations. I know that it motivated and inspired me, 
Um, so let's jump into the passage and start with our biblical basis for missions. Uh, so we're going to start with the authority of Jesus in verse 18. He says, I'll just read it again. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So we'll see, you know, often in this passage when we read it, uh, when you've heard it preached maybe, uh, we just jump right over the authority aspect. We just go straight into the missions, right? We, we jump over this verse and just go, go make disciples of all nations. Go, go, teach them, baptize them. All very, very good things. Um, but I think it would be a mistake to jump over this authority that Jesus starts with. Um, he tells them all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. So we know that, uh, well, what is that authority? You know, what's been given to him? What does it look like? And, and we know that the disciples um, whom he's speaking to right here, they demonstrated quite, uh, he, he demonstrated quite a bit of authority to them while he walked on the earth um, and in front of them. So a few examples, right? The weather in Matthew 8, 23 through 27, Jesus calms the winds and the waves with just a word. They're on a boat, ready to sink. They're freaking out. They think their lives are over. And Jesus just tells the storm to stop, and it stops. He walks on water to them. He meets the disciples in the middle of the sea. Jesus really has a thing with water. Um, he has authority over disease and sickness. Countless times, Jesus heals the blind, the lame, the sick, paralyzed, leprous. And it's, it's easy for him. He does it with the word. Sometimes he uses dirt with the blind. Um, but nothing is too big a deal for him to heal. He has authority over life and death. In John 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead just by calling out to the tomb. And, Jesus walks, er, and Lazarus walks out of the tomb alive. He raises Jairus' daughter from the dead in Matthew 9, 25, again with a word, just grabs by the hand. He has authority over food. Uh, how many times did he feed crowds of thousands with just a few loaves and some fish? He turned water into wine in John 2. He, knows, uh, he has authority over people. He knows the, inten the intentions and thoughts of the heart. Um, and often calls the Pharisees out on their heart conditions, he knows their hearts. He knows their needs, spiritual and physical. He also has authority over spirits, right, and demons, the spiritual realm. He casts them out. The man who lived among the tombs, who was unable to be restrained in Luke 8, uh, he had a legion of demons within him, right, maybe, maybe two men. Um, and Jesus ordered them, the demons, to leave. And they begged him, please don't cast us into the pit. Um, so he, he lets them go into the pigs, right, and all the pigs run off, off the cliff. Jesus has authority over the spirits, well, Jesus also spoke to his authority that was given to him by the Father, right? Not just stuff he demonstrated. Um, John 3.35 says the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. So here's just a few things the Father has authority over that he's given to Jesus. Um, he has authority to give eternal life. Uh, John 17.2, he says, you have given him, this is Jesus speaking to the Father, you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. He has authority over humanity to, ex to the extent that even your hairs are numbered. Not a single hair falls from your head without the authority of the Father, by extension, Jesus. Pastor Greg spoke on this recently. I wish Jesus had seen fit to use his authority to give me the number of hairs on Pastor Ben's head. <laughs> but I am not in charge. Uh, he's also given authority to Jesus over the rise and fall of governments. Uh, he tells the oceans how far they can go. Hebrews 3.13 says he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Colossians 1.17 says that he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So he has authority over the very fabric of the universe, the planets, the molecules, the stars, everything. And he has authority over his church, and he will build it. Matthew 16, 18. So Jesus' authority is clearly spoken. There's more, right? I just touched on a few. Um, and, and it's clearly demonstrated in front of the disciples countless times. And so I think Jesus comes to this mountain to talk to the disciples and immediately reminds them of his authority as he's about to give them this, this important command. Um, and that command, right, is the, is the next couple verses, right? The commission of Jesus. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. I'm just going to stop there for a second. You'll notice he says, go, therefore, meaning on the basis of what I just said, go. So on the basis of my authority, the fact that it's been given to me in heaven and earth, um, go. So the next natural question is, why is he using his basis? Um, why is he using his authority as the basis for going and making disciples? Um, what is it about his authority that makes it the basis um, or the reason for the disciples to go forth to all the nations and make disciples? Well, I think, I think there's at least four reasons. There's probably more reasons, um, but I thought of four. So I think, one, his authority should remove all fear. 
Think about the situation the disciples were in, right? Just prior to this, when Jesus is coming to them. Well, a couple things. They've, they've seen his authority demonstrated, right? They saw him feed the 5,000 and the 4,000. They ate of it themselves. They were in the boat when he calmed the storm. Uh, they were there when he healed countless sick, the blind. Um, they were there when they saw Jesus speak to Lazarus and raise him from the dead. They saw him discern the thoughts and intentions of men as they engaged him in conversation. And they saw the men in the garden who came to arrest him fall back in fear at his voice. So they've seen Jesus' authority, right? So they, they have that background. But also, kind of in contrast, humanly speaking, um, they also saw him become weak. And they saw him arrested in the garden um, and taken before the courts, their Messiah. Uh, they saw him beaten and bruised. They saw him placed on a cross and crucified. Um, the account in Luke 23 says that his disciples and acquaintances were standing at a distance, standing afar, um, they were probably afraid. They saw him laid in a tomb. And so we know that they were afraid. They were hiding after the crucifixion. They were in a locked room for fear of the Jews, it says in John 21, um, when Jesus appeared to them through a locked door. Uh, and then we know that they were also still doubting at this point, right? In, in, in verse 16, it says that some doubted. And so we, we know that, that they are filled with the knowledge of Jesus' authority, not only from their personal experience of what they actually saw and experienced, um, but also what has been told them and what they know from scripture. Um, and they were afraid and still doubting as well. And so I think Jesus is telling them about his authority and reminding them about what they've seen and heard, basically saying, there's no reason to fear storms when I can quiet them. I have the authority. There's no reason to fear men when I have the authority to stop them in their tracks. Uh, there's no reason to fear spiritual powers when I command them with just a word. There's no reason to fear death when I've beaten death here I am, um, and promise life to all who trust me. And there's no reason to be afraid of what to say before men when I can loose the tongue and give sight to the blind. So I think the first reason he mentions his authority is to remove their fear. Um, the second reason is his authority should give them confidence that the mission can't fail. Right? Since Jesus has all authority, his promises can't fail. For example, Matthew 24, he says, uh, or this, the promise that the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed to all nations. Then the end will come. He says it will be proclaimed. Not it might, or I hope it is. It will be. And we know that not a word of the Lord will fail. Isaiah 55, 11 says that his word will not return empty, but it will accomplish that for which he sent it. So his promises cannot and will not fail. And then we just saw he will build his church. Matthew 16, we just talked about it. The gates of hell cannot stand against it. So the making of disciples resulting in churches is promised to succeed. And then Revelation 7, 9. John sees a great multitude, a vision of the future, standing before the throne from all nations, tribes, and tongues, worshiping God. So the commission coming in this passage cannot fail because Jesus promised that it would not, and he has all authority. So that's the second reason. Give them confidence that the mission cannot fail. And the third reason I think he mentions his authority um, is it, that, that means that they will be provided for and equipped for their mission. Uh, we just heard Pastor Dave preach on the provision of the Lord in Luke 12. They only need to concern themselves with the kingdom, and the rest would be added to them. Now, does that mean they won't suffer or experience pain or loss or hardship? Well, of course not. Um, but his desire is not that they would concern themselves with potential hardships, um, but to trust him for those things that they need when they need them. So it also says that he will empower them through his spirit in Acts 1.8 to be his witnesses. He's going to give them what they need. Psalm 50 says the cattle on a thousand hills are his. Does the Lord lack provision? Does he lack anything? No. So he can and will provide what they need, both spiritually and physically. So I think that's the third reason that he mentions his authority, so that they will be provided for. They know they'll be provided for. And finally, I think he mentions his authority uh, because it means they must obey. So I think this kind of goes without saying, but Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Therefore, they must obey him. Um, he uses an imperative. I'm sure he uses an imperative in Greek, but I don't know Greek. So I know in English, Go. He doesn't kindly ask or beg of them, please, would you guys just consider like maybe going for me? That'd be awesome. Um, no, he doesn't, he doesn't beg them or ask them to consider. He says, go. In Matthew 8, 5 through 13, even the centurion recognizes Jesus' authority because he describes his own authority, right? He says, I say to one, go, and he goes. Uh, I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. So Jesus' authority to command obedience goes beyond that, of course. Um, I think the centurion commands authority in a way that 
maybe compels his servants or men beneath him to obey, maybe out of fear of repercussions. It might get beaten or out, of, or out of respect. And I think Jesus does command this kind of authority as well, respect and fear. Um, after all, he tells the crowds to not fear man, but fear him who has the authority to cast body and soul into hell. But I think Jesus' authority, he has the authority to enforce obedience to his commands if he so desires. He's the sovereign king of the universe. Philippians 2 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. People will bow. Those who scoff now will bow later. Those who refuse now will have no choice then. So Jesus has an authority that makes the authority of the centurion seem puny in comparison. And so how much more should the disciples there at the mountain and the church now uh, obey the commands of Jesus when even the centurion's servants obey so readily? So I think if his authority means he can tell them what to do, um, not to do what he commands is disobedience. So his authority should remove fear. It should give them confidence that their mission can't fail and um, that they will be provided for. And it reminds them that they must obey. So we see his authority as the basis for the, the part that comes next. Go because of my authority and make disciples of all nations. So the nations here um, are a reference to ethnicities, not our more typically used English version that's like political nation states, like the nation of the United States. Um, John Piper has, has a really good chapter on this in Let the Nations Be Glad. Uh, I highly recommend that book, where he walks through an argument for why this is. Um, and it has to do with Greek and things that I'm not an expert in. Um, so we can all ask Pastor Dave about this one later and double check me on it. Um, but basically, the Greek phrase used here, panta ta ethne, which I probably mispronounced, um, it's most often used to refer to the Gentile or non-Jewish nations um, as people groups. Uh, so although the phrase can sometimes be used to refer to like an gent uh, Gentile individuals um, or people groups, it's most often used in the New Testament and the Greek Old Testament that they had at the time. Um, it, it's most often used to mean people groups and not just Gentile individuals. So what's a people group then? Um, it can be delineated in multiple ways. So we're gonna go, I'm going to go with the Joshua Project. They define it this way. In most parts of the world, lack of understandability acts as the main barrier to the gospel. And it is appropriate to define people group primarily by language, with the possibility of subdivisions based on dialect or cultural variations. Such a list may be referred to as an ethno-linguistic list of peoples. So essentially, it's a group of people who speak the same language um, and have the same or similar culture that would be defined as a people group. So this is hard uh, for most of us to understand. Uh, most people here being from the United States where we, we all speak English, everyone within 300 miles, 600 miles, 1200 miles in every direction speaks English. Um, and so it's kind of hard to understand, but take a moment, if you will, and imagine that you're part of a group of people who reside in like a single village in the middle of a vast rainforest. Um, you all speak the same language. You have distinct cultural values and traditions like like maybe you're required to kill a wild boar at night to become a man. Not a man then. None of us are men probably. If you've killed a wild boar at night, please tell me. It's cool. Um, but these distinctives would, you know, primarily on the language front, but culturally as well, would mean that there's a barrier to you understanding the gospel if someone were to come and bring it to you. So if someone came to your, vi to your village from anywhere in the world, they could be 15 miles away in another village. You might not understand them. And they might not be able to understand you because of language. So that's the idea of the nations or people groups that are in view here, that, that small even. Um, and so this isn't the only place where the nations are mentioned either, right? Uh, we just heard it in First Chronicles. I didn't even use that one. But there's more. There's tons of references to the nations experiencing the gospel, experiencing salvation. You think in the Old Testament, no, it's not there. Oh, it's there. So in Genesis 12, 3 even, uh, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's God speaking to Abraham. The Psalms in countless places reference the nations. Psalm 2.8, I will make the nations your heritage. Messianic Psalm speaking to Jesus. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. In Isaiah, it's all over the place. Isaiah 63, and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. We just heard it in Matthew, in Luke, says in Luke 24, repentance and forgiveness should be proclaimed to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. 
And we already referenced Revelation 7, 8, and 9 with all the nations, tribes, and tongues standing before the throne, worshiping. So the nations, they will hear, they will exalt in the Lord, they will come to him, and they will worship him. This is a promise, and it's demonstrated all throughout scripture from beginning to end. So he tells them to make disciples among all the nations, and he follows it more or less with how to do that. Um, he says to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says to teach them to obey or observe all that he commanded them. And he doesn't explicitly say it here, but I think it's assumed that the gospel will have to be proclaimed first. Um, the only way people will call on him is if they believe. And they will only believe if they hear about him. And they will only hear about him if someone preaches to them. And they will only be preached to if someone is sent to preach to them. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Romans 10. And we also know the gospel is the power of salvation, Romans 1.16. So I think you'll agree that to make disciples, you've got to start with the gospel. Um, and I think, I'm going to talk about the gospel a little bit, right? What is the good news? I think I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the gospel or preach the gospel when speaking on missions and not lay it out. Um, and Pastor Dave preached on, this was just last week, but it starts with bad news. That's what the good news starts with, is bad news. Um, and that bad news is that God is the creator and the authority over who is guilty and who is innocent, and none of us are innocent. That's the bad news. You're not innocent. I'm not innocent. Man has broken God's law and deserves just punishment for it. Romans 3, there's none righteous. Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. So we deserve the just punishment of God. His wrath poured out against sin in the eternal fire of hell. That's what we deserve. But there is good news. Christ came to earth as both fully man and fully God to live a perfect life that we could not and die the death we deserved, suffering under the wrath of God poured out against sin so that those who have faith in him would be reconciled to him. And he rose again and is alive today and offers life to all who believe in his name. And it's not enough just to hear these things. Everyone must repent of their sin and believe in him, in Jesus, that he died for their sins and rose again. Romans 10 again says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So after someone believes and they place their faith in Jesus, the first act of obedience is baptism. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So one of the two ordinances of the church, the Lord's Supper being the other one. And this is the definition from Heritage. I won't um, belabor this baptism point, um, but it, from Heritage's uh, website, it's, Christian baptism by immersion is the public testimony of a believer's faith in the crucified, buried, and risen Savior and his union with him in death to sin and resurrection to a new life. It is also a sign of fellowship and identification with the visible body of Christ. So it's an act of obedience after conversion. So new disciples are to be baptized in the name of the triune God. Not only are they to be baptized, um, but the disciples are also to teach others about all Jesus commanded. Well, what does that include? Well, there's a lot. Um, Jesus taught many things while on earth, right? Uh, it's written in the Gospels. What he, what he taught, that's clearly in view here, uh, like the Sermon on the Mount, for example. Um, all of the Old Testament is included in this as well. Some, you know, not everything applies to the church as it did to Israel, but the Old Testament is not nullified. Um, on the contrary, Christ came to fulfill the law, not abolish it. We see that in Matthew 5. So all of Scripture is for our instruction that's what the, the disciples are to teach the others to observe. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So this is the model we see Paul and the other apostles doing all throughout their ministry in Acts. They bring the gospel to new places. People believe. They baptize new believers. They teach new believers what it means to be disciples. They set up elders to continue that teaching. They ask others to ensure they teach and build up the church. Leaders like Timothy and Titus. Paul visits the churches again to teach them and strengthen them. So the apostolic carrying out of this command and how it led them to church planting and church strengthening really leads me to believe that this is the mission of the church. It's not just a command to individuals. Uh, Kevin DeYoung and Greg Gilbert put it this way in their book, What is the Mission of the Church? They say, the mission of the church is to go into the world and make disciples by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit and gathering these disciples into churches, that they might worship the Lord 
and obey his commands now and in eternity to the glory of God the Father. So that's the mission of the church. Go in the world, make disciples. So where are we in this great commission? I want to take a moment and just speak to the, the state of this great task that we've been given as a church. I'm going to throw some statistics out about people groups. I'm going to show you a couple graphs. Um, and I'm sharing this not to make us think like, ah, oh, when can we time the, the, the return of Jesus and usher in his return? Nope, not doing that. Um, I'm also not sharing this to shame or coerce you into giving or, or anything like that. Rather, I'm trying to remind us of the urgency that we should have in reaching the world for Christ um, and helping those who haven't heard to hear. So I'm sharing this as a reminder that the Great Commission is not finished. Um, it didn't end with the disciples, thankfully, because we are here, um, and it's not over with us. So we've been doing this church planning thing for a couple thousand years, so we must be pretty close. Um, not quite. Uh, there, are, there are around 3,100 unreached language groups. This number is, it just depends on, on how you count it. Um, some numbers talk about people groups a little bit differently, and so they will say numbers as high as like 4,600 or 7,000 unreached. It kind of depends on how you, you count it. Um, but unreached is defined this way by the Joshua Project. An unreached or least reached people group is a people group among which there is no indigenous community of believing Christians with adequate numbers and resources to evangelize this people group without outside assistance. So basically, it's a group of people who have few to no believers and very few, if any, resources to evangelize their own people without outside assistance. Um, I was given this... Uh, a few of us went to the missionary conference recently in Florida from the Missions Council, and I was given this, this uh, Bible that is kind of an example of most of the, the Bible that most of these language groups have access to at this time. Um, it's empty. Most of these people have no Bible. Some of us have 10 of them sitting on the shelf at home. And we have 100 translations in English. Some of these people have none. So they have no churches, Few, if any, believers, no scriptures, and therefore no hope. Um, and most have none translated into a language they can even understand. So they are at risk of eternal fire. And it's been this way for quite some time. Um, and that's because the remaining unreached live in some of the most hostile places on earth. Uh, parts of the Middle East, parts of North Africa, Southeast Asia, parts that are hard to reach because of governments or geography. It's very difficult. So the situation is very very urgent still. Um, so, TV, you can bring up that other slide. Next one. Uh, the Western church in general, I want to say, I know it's hard to read. You don't have to read the numbers or anything. Um, it's just the, the length of the lines. Um, the church in general has a problem of focus, the Western church. Um, and I'm going to kind of draw attention to that here. All the stats that I'm, I'm giving you are from the travelingteam.org. So if you want to look into these things as well, you can. Uh, but you'll see that at the top there, on the, on the left side, is um, all the lines in red. And those are just regions of the world. And it's showing the number of unreached people groups in that region of the world. And so it's from highest to lowest. Um, and you'll see on the right is the number of missionaries going to those regions. And you'll kind of see that the graphs are reversed a little bit. So you see the longest lines are on the top, on the left side. And on, on the right side, the shortest lines are on the top, meaning the fewest missionaries are sent to those places. Um, and so most missionaries, about 77%, go to those who are already reached with the gospel. And they work in areas where the church is already well-established. Um, so where I went in Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire, there is a church there. Um, I believe that the work we did while in Ivory Coast wasn't a waste by any means. Um, but there are places in the world where no one has ever heard the gospel. The top there is South Asia, you know, around India. Um, there are places in the world where, where no one's ever heard the gospel, like that, where there's no church, places where the church is, is struggling immensely under persecution or maybe even bad teaching, um, syncretism, the mixing of other religions with Christianity, uh, or even other hostilities, right? Political hostilities, violence. Um, so I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we don't go to the places where there is a church, so don't hear me saying that. Um, those churches need to be nurtured and supported and encouraged. So this is, it's not a problem to go to those places or support those churches by any means. No. Um, we see Timothy and Titus being sent to strengthen churches. We see Paul constantly revisiting churches he planted, you know, making sure they're remaining faithful and growing. So that type of ministry must still happen. It's absolutely essential. So don't hear that. 
However, there is an issue of focus. The highest need area has a relatively small number of missionaries going there. Um, and the lowest need areas have the most missionaries going there. So on the graph there, right, on the bottom, the blue, the longest line is going to the place where there's some of the fewest, uh, the least need. So there's a focus problem at the very least. Um, in addition to people going to the places that need at least, most funds do not go to these areas um, or even to missions at all. Uh, it's estimated uh, that the entire church universal earns $54 trillion a year trillion dollars a year. Um, can you bring up the next slide? So I know this is hard to understand. I'm going to explain it a little bit here. Um, so the very top blue line uh, and the orange on the end, that is all that the $54 trillion that Christians worldwide earn. And that little orange piece is what is given to the church as like tithe or give, you know, mission, any, any sort of giving whatsoever. Um, and then the line below that, the little gray line, that's that same orange piece, um, but it's just divided between local and foreign, where it's given, um, where, does it stay local or does it go to foreign missions? Well, since it's so small there and you can barely see it, the second graph down, that's that gray line kind of stretched out so you can actually see it. So the gray there is all the money that stays local. Um, it stays where it was tithed to. Uh, and that's the numbers here. 1.86% is given to any Christian cause. So that's the little orange. Uh, and then 12% um, or sorry, 94% uh, stays local. So that's the gray all the way across there. And the yellow is what goes to missions in general. And then right beneath that is the lighter blue. Well, that one's pretty small too. So we stretched that one out as well on the very bottom graph. That's the missions giving stretched out. The blue is going to reached people groups and the green, uh, which is 1.7% of that goes to the unreached. And so none of this is to shame us or to guilt us into giving more. No, this is to motivate us. Uh, it's to motivate us to remember that uh, one, missions is not optional for the church. It's not a side program um, that a few people should consider, you know, wondering about. Um, this, is, this isn't a thing that, that super Christians do. No, no, missions is for the church. Um, John Piper famously says, missions exist because worship does not. And there is places in the world where worship does not exist. Um, and there's great need for missions and missionaries to go there and for funding to go there. So Pastor Dave spoke a little bit about this um, in Luke 12 uh, a couple weeks ago in the parable about the rich fool. He says, uh, you know, this man selfishly kept all he had to use it for his own selfish gain. He thought extra stuff was his reason for living. But we, we know from the passage, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Don't believe the false promise of plenty. Dave said, serve God with your wealth. Serve others. We, in America, like the rich fool, have been blessed abundantly. Um, and although it doesn't say it in the stats exactly how much of that wealth of Christians is in the U.S., we know that a large majority of it is in the U.S. Um, I read a stat that said that uh, American Christians spend more on costume uh, costumes for their dogs for Halloween than is spent on missions, which is, it's kind of eye-opening to hear that. Um, and so the mission of the church is to, is given to make disciples of all nations, not to hoard our wealth. Um, so we've seen the authority of Jesus as the basis for his commission to the disciples to go and make disciples, baptize them, teach them. Now we will see uh, the comfort of Jesus. So this is the final part. He says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's the last part of verse 20. So he doesn't appeal to anything here, um, but his presence. These are his final words in Matthew's gospel. And I think he's doing a few things here. One, I think he's reiterating that we are not alone. Um, even though, well, that they are not alone and us. They are not alone, even though their mission will not be easy. They will suffer hardships and be hated by the world, right? John 15, 20. Remember, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So we see that this mission will result in them being hated, maligned, persecuted. Um, we saw it in Acts. When you read Acts, it's all over. They suffer in obedience to this commission. They even die. Many of the disciples uh, were martyred, John being the exception. So he's telling them they won't be alone despite their mission being extremely difficult. 
they will lose much. But I also think Jesus has these kind of bookends of authority on the front end and comfort on the back end. So uh, Jesus' authority and his presence are like two bookends to encourage and embolden them, but also to comfort them. Uh, So he's saying, you know, I have authority, so your mission can't fail, and I will be with you the whole time. I have authority, and so you shall not fear what comes next, regardless of what comes next. I am with you. He says, I have authority, and so command you to go and maybe even die, but I will not leave your side. So despite the challenges they face in making disciples of all nations, Despite the hostility, the threat of bodily harm, even death, uh, Jesus will be with them. And I think he's also saying here that he's worth it. Um, His presence is meant to comfort them and be enough for them. Paul believed this. In Philippians 3.8, he says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul suffered tremendously. He was stoned several times, beaten, thrown out, shipwrecked. But the giving of their lives, the disciples and ours, for the sake of the gospel going to the nations, is counted as nothing to Paul. A demonstration of the worth of the kingdom of heaven, and thereby Jesus, is in Matthew 13, 44, when, he, when Jesus tells the parable about the man who finds a treasure in the field. Um, and in his joy, goes and sells all that he has so he can buy that field. Well, the idea here is that this man joyfully sells all that he has, right, to have the kingdom. It wasn't a sacrifice to him to lose all that he had uh, in order to gain the kingdom. Uh, David Livingston, uh, a well-known missionary to Africa, said the following about Jesus um, and about his mission. He says, Quote, for my own part, I have never ceased to rejoice that God has appointed me to such an office. People talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. He goes on to say, away with the word in such a view and with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather, it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then with a foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and may cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. End quote. So Jesus' presence should give us great comfort as we go about the task of making disciples of all nations. Whatever the cost, um, his presence should be our very joy and life. His presence is worth it. Whatever we must give up, whether it's house or family or friends or money or health or even life itself for the sake of the gospel, uh, we should say with Livingston, I never made a sacrifice. Jesus is worth it. So maybe some more application points for us. Um, This passage is not just for those who were present there at that moment. Uh, It's for us too. Um, He says, with you always to the end of the age. Uh, So it's not only for those who died within the next 60 years, you know, is that the end of the age? No. Um, This is for all who would believe because of their faithfulness. So a few points of application for us to be obedient to the Great Commission. Uh, One, how much should we care about missions in the strict sense, really? Um, Well, what do I mean about the strict sense? Uh, I believe that this passage is mainly speaking about strict missions, as in the type of work that cross-cultural missionaries do. Um, Why? Well, Jesus specifically referenced the nations or people groups um, outside of Jewish people group, um, which we talked about. So, you know, going to your neighbors or your coworkers to share the gospel, that's not missions. It is important. It is evangelism, and it's hugely important. But it is not missions. Um, That's what I'm arguing. So, um, and the reference to nations or world is in all the other Great Commission passages as well. We didn't talk about those, but in Luke, in Acts, and in Mark, it's all about going um, to the earth or to the other nations. So I think the focus is on, on nations, the nations aspect of going and making disciples outside of your normal cultural context. Uh, so to answer the, the question, how much should we care about missions? Um, I think we should care a lot about missions. <laughs> um, if the Great Commission is the main passage directing global missions for the church, and the mission of the church 
is to make new converts and establish new churches and nurture those churches, then we should care deeply about foreign missions. Um, let us not be so bold as to think that because we don't know those on the other side of the globe, that we shouldn't care about missions. Uh, let us not be so self-centered to think that if we're not going to the nations ourselves, that missions isn't important. Let's not be so proud to think that we can ignore Jesus' final recorded words to his disciples that are an explicit directive to reach the nations with the gospel. So I hope you can see the folly in thinking that way, um, that it's not important, uh, and can, can agree that we should care a lot about missions. So how do we obey the Great Commission? I think there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, most of us should be senders and support those who do go to the nations. Um, we are all called to make disciples, yes, but only some are going to go be missionaries in that, that cross-cultural sense. Uh, most of us are called to be faithful in evangelism and disciple-making where we are um, and be senders of those who do go because we need far more senders than we do goers. How will those who go be supported if everyone goes? Well, they can't. Um, so churches should be richly supporting those who go to the nations and thereby participate in the Great Commission. So how can you be a sender? Well, the goers need generous support in the form of finances and prayer, encouragement, visits, and love. Um, they need that to be able to go and to be able to stay and persevere in the work. Um, that requires a whole lot of senders. So as someone who was on the field at one point, I can tell you some of the ways people ministered to me while I was gone um, that really made a difference. One, reach out regularly. So if you support missionaries abroad, um, reach out to them, ask how they're doing, you know, ask how they're handling the stress of living cross-culturally, ask how languages, language learning is coming. That's always a fun one. Um, someone at the missionary conference put it this way. It's like banging your head against a wall. That's what language learning is like. It's true. Um, ask how their kids are doing, ask them about any needs they may have. Uh, pray for them. So they give you their needs. Ask them for ways to be praying, uh, but not, not just for the ministry, but for them as well, personally. Read their updates. Pray for those things. Let them know that you're praying for them. Support them generously. Uh, Paul speaks to several churches in his letters, telling them to ensure missionaries were well supplied when sent on their way. Visit them, even. Um, when I was in Ivory Coast, anyone on our team had a visitor. Oh, it was super encouraging to everyone on the team. It was really uplifting. So if you have a close relationship with your missionaries, um, and it would be a blessing to them, ask them if you can visit them. Be a blessing to them. Um, consider joining our missions council here at Heritage. Uh, we meet monthly to discuss all the missionaries and local ministries we support as a church. Uh, we pray for them, and we make decisions on how to best steward the resources we have and allocate funds. So this is the best way to stay updated on, on missionaries. I hope you guys had a chance to, to be downstairs um, during missions Sunday, Sunday school time um, to learn about some of the missions we support. So those are some ways um, that, you can, that you can be involved in the Great Commission. Um, some of us should be goers, though. Some have to go. The need is urgent across the world. Every single day, hundreds of thousands of people die in their sin having never heard the gospel. Someone has to go and tell them about this Jesus who can rescue them from the wrath of God stored up against them for their sin. So if you're feeling drawn to go, talk to the elders. Um, express your desire to them. Prepare yourself to go. Aspire to the office of elder. Know your Bible. And, and most importantly, abide in the Lord. Um, it's only through abiding in him that you will be able to persevere in some of the hardest environments. Uh, not only physically speaking, but to your faith as well. The bottom line, though, none of us should be disobedient. Um, I heard it put this way at that missionary conference. If you're not going and you're not sending, you're disobeying. So... Um, I hope that this Great Commission passage has given you a zeal for Jesus and his worth uh, and also motivated you to be passionate for the gospel going to the nations. So if you're not a believer, I urge you, repent of your sins, believe in Jesus and his death and resurrection, and confess him as Lord. He's worth it. I assure you, he's worth it. In church, believers... Let's remember the importance of missions in the life of the church. It's not a side project or a church program. Uh, some of Jesus' last words on earth are telling his disciples and us not to neglect this task. So let us not be disobedient. Whether intentionally or not, that's no excuse. Um, let's not settle for giving 1% of our income to the church and even less to the cause of missions. Let's not be like the rich fool who thought life consisted in an abundance of possessions. 
And let's not forget that the Lord of heaven and earth, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the very Savior who died for us while we were still sinners and still enemies with God, the beloved Son of God is worth giving everything for. He is worth dying for. He commissioned us, his people, to go to the nations and make disciples. So give and pray and go for Jesus' sake and for the sake of those who without the gospel will never hear. But fear not, uh, the task will be accomplished. Um, Jesus will build his church and people from all tribes, tongues, and nations will worship around the throne. Okay, and pray with me. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for your word. Um, I thank you um, that you are passionate um, about having worshipers from every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping before your throne. Um, I pray that you would give us a zeal and passion for missions, um, that you give us a zeal and passion for you, um, so that we can't keep our mouths shut about who you are and how great you are. Lord, help us to realize it is worth giving everything um, to participate in this great commission. Um, I pray that you would help make us all obedient. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.